Um, I've been thinking about this this last year and everything that has gone on in our lives. The stuff, you know, the, the school's closing and churches closing and opening back up, businesses, you know, shutting down and, you know, are we going to survive this stuff? Um, our church has lost six members of our church to COVID. I lost a friend and a co-worker, Brian Bowman, who is very instrumental in, in the things that happen here at this church, and it's been a rough year. Pastor Aaron, our lead pastor, his father passed away in April. Um, a crazy election season with all that. I don't even get into that. Um, racial tensions. It's been a crazy, crazy year. Crazy economy, crazy stock market. We're just We don't know what's going on. And then a phone call from the bishop, and Pastor Aaron is moving to a new city. Yeah. Oh, and then a clog in the Suez Canal. Let's throw that on like a cherry on top, right? It's been... <laughs> It's been a great year. Life and death, joy and pain, um, despair. But Easter, oh my, Easter. It's like a breath of fresh air. I can't wait to just, I was just itching to get up here today. One, because it's Easter and it's like the Super Bowl for pastors, right? But two, I look out here and there's people in the audience. Talk about, I got some nerves. I'm just saying, you know, I'm used to, you know, just talking to the TV or something. I don't know. But this is awesome. Easter is about how life wins. No matter what, Easter is about how life wins. It doesn't matter what's going on in our life, and sometimes we get down and we're scared and things are happening. This whole 2020 year was crazy with COVID, and we think that death wins. No way. No way. Life wins. That's what Easter is all about, right? I'm absolutely just pumped to be talking about, as your pastor, you already know what today is. You know what I'm going to talk about, right? It's like Christmas Eve. It's, you know exactly what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Easter. So today, we're going to celebrate our risen Lord, the resurrection of Jesus. Is that not awesome? Yeah? All you guys online? Yeah. Let's give it up for that, Jesus. But when we look at this and we think about Easter and everything that the empty cross represents, oh my gosh. Now, I think Easter points to, to the answer, to the answer to a question that everybody should ask. And I would, I would like to say it's the most important question, but, I, you know, maybe the most important question in the world, but I won't because some of you may disagree with that. You guys like popping the question to get married. You know, there's all kinds of these great big questions in our lives. But I think it's really, really important. It's one that, that everybody should ask. Maybe you haven't asked it in a long time. Maybe, maybe you're, this is your first time back. Maybe you're watching online because it's Easter. Maybe somebody brought you here today and you're just a guest and you're wondering, what is that question? But if you haven't asked it since you were a kid or if you've been a Christian a long, long time and you haven't asked this question, maybe you should. And that question is, who is Jesus? And that cross, him coming off of that cross, it speaks volumes. It just shouts to the world exactly who Jesus is. It's so important because the resurrection is what convinced the first century followers to believe who Jesus was, to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, that he was God in a bod, right? Jesus, God, came down to this earth and was one of us. It wasn't Jesus' teachings that convinced them. It wasn't any of the miracles that convinced him. No, it was the resurrection. And the resurrection has been convincing people ever since. Because we, we serve and we live in the world of a risen Lord, a Lord who is alive and well. Now listen, we don't just believe that Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible tells us so. It's way, way, way bigger than that. It's way, way more substantial than that. We believe Jesus rose from the dead because of what eyewitnesses saw and heard and were a part of. The first century followers of Jesus, a tax collector named Matthew, documented the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And we believe because a Greek named Mark, Mark, who was a friend of the disciple Peter, he, he listened to Peter and he got 
Peter's story out of him, and he decided that he, Peter was telling the truth that Jesus actually rose from the dead. If that's not enough, how about this? We believe because a doctor named Luke, a very methodical Greek who traveled all around Judea and the Mediterranean with the Apostle Paul, right? With our church is named after Paul. He came to the conclusion that he met so many people that saw the risen Lord that he believed. And he wrote and gave us the account that we call the Gospel of Luke. We, have, we, we believe because the Apostle Peter... Peter, an eyewitness, he left two different letters to first century ch churches that, that declared Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is alive. That's what they were telling us. Every one of them were, would believe that and tell us that. We believe Jesus rose from the dead. And this is one of my favorites is because James, James, the brother of Jesus, was convinced that his brother was the Lord, his Lord, in fact. I have two older brothers, and believe me, they've tried my entire life to convince me that they are my Lord. But can, can you imagine? James says, my brother is the Lord. James, his brother, really was it. James wasn't convinced by any of Jesus' sermons. I can just imagine James sitting in the back of the, in the, back of the church, where just kind of rolling his eyes, here we go again, <laughs> right? James, it wasn't the sermons. It wasn't any of the miracles. What it was that changed James's mind was that he saw Jesus rise from the dead. It was the resurrection. That's what it's all about. Like Pastor Ben just said, our faith is based on the resurrection. And these extraordinarily brave people, every one of them, they documented what they saw and what they heard. What they heard from others and, and what they had seen and heard about people who talked about the resurrected Jesus. And these documents, they were collected, and they were pr protected, and eventually put into and combined into a volume in the Bible that we call the New Testament. But long before there was a B-I-B-L-E Bible, what does Bible stand for? Do you guys know? I'm just throwing this out there, a little movie trivia. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Anybody? No? Okay. Anyway, before there was a Bible, these men and women were eyewitnesses of and friends of people who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. It was the resurrection that changed everything, everything. Their whole world was turned upside down, and not just for followers of Jesus, but for everyone, all of us included, our world was turned upside down. Oh, man, and these, these, these people that were writing the books that we call the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, all of this stuff. These people were so close to Jesus, and when they wrote, they were excruciatingly honest. I mean, if I'm writing a story, I'm going to leave out the part where I mispronounce somebody's name. I'm going to leave out the part where I tripped and fall off the stage here in a minute, right? I'm not going to tell you those parts about my life. They were so honest. That it's one of the reasons that we should take them seriously when we talk about what they wrote and what we read. They don't write themselves into the stories as these huge heroes. They write themselves into the, into the story as people just like you and me. They write themselves into the story as doubters. We doubt it, right? We've had moments of weaknesses where, I don't know about this God thing. I really don't. I'm not sure. But these guys, these people, they all doubted. And listen, they expected Jesus to do what all dead people do. What is that? They stay dead. Exactly. They expected Jesus to stay dead. I love how Andy Stanley puts it. Nobody, not even his closest, most committed followers, nobody expected no body. They didn't expect there not to be a body in that tomb. Every person who loved and was devoted to Jesus figured he was gone and gone for good. Dead, right? He's gone. Out of our lives. And they figured at that point that Jesus, he was not who he said he was. If he really was the Son of God, how could he be crucified and die? He, he can't be who he claimed to be because Jesus called himself the Son of God, the Son of Man. And you can't, the Son of Man can't be killed. He said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you can't kill that. He claimed and called himself the light of the world, and you cannot crucify the light. But Jesus, 
was dead. So he must have been lying, right? Can you imagine how these disciples and apostles are feeling? The other person that was an eyewitness and a follower of Jesus who gives us his account is John, right? And that's how I remember it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah, he's one of them, one of the Gospels, right? John, he wrote this eyewitness of, of the account of what he witnessed, right? He saw Jesus. He knew Jesus. He walked with Jesus, and he saw his resurrection. He saw his crucifixion. He saw his death. He saw it all, and John details this stuff for us, but just like all of the other followers of Jesus, all these other disciples, he did not expect the crucifixion to actually happen. He did not expect there to be a resurrection, because once you're dead, you're dead. Like the rest, John was really expecting a king. You, to be a little more specific, they, John and all the rest were expecting this general to come out. And, you know, he has these, you know, these robes, these priestly robes, but they expected him to rip that robe off. And there'd be a big S on his chest for savior of the world, right? But when in their mind, they were thinking he's going to save them from the Roman oppression. They wanted this general to come with might and force and take over everything and put the Jewish people back on top. That's what they were expecting. That's what they wanted. And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. So he gets together with them for a last meal, the last supper. It's during the Passover in Jerusalem. And instead of hatching this power plan where, you know, where he takes over the world, he says this, he tells them, he says, here's the new covenant I want you to live by. Are you ready? This is, get your pens out, write this stuff down. Are you ready? Listen, he says, love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. Love one another. You are to love each other. Not the way that you've been loved. No, 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 no. Not the way that you want to be loved. No, that's not good enough. This is a whole other thing. You are to love one another the way that I have loved you. You and you and you are to love one another the way that Jesus loves you. And that changes things, right, when it comes to, ooh, I love you, right? Ooh, I see some of you are dating and you're cuddling up next to your boy or girl or whatever. It's not that kind of love. It's this agape love, this overwhelming love. And on the very next day, Jesus demonstrates that love in a way that would take their breath away. We talked about this last Sunday, right? He, they leave the Passover meal, and they go to the garden to pray, and he prays a prayer that is just amazing, right? The, the sweat, and it's tainted with blood, and he's just praying this real prayer. There's any other way, right? But he's already been betrayed by Judas. It's already happened. The wheels are turning. It's all set in motion. And then they're surrounded by the Roman soldiers, and Judas is there, and then there's a kiss, and then there's a scuffle, and Jesus is captured what does his disciples do? They bow up and are ready to fight. No, they scatter. They run away. And then Jesus is put through this illegal religious trial. And they beat him and they spit on him. He's taken to the Roman governor, Pilate, and this religious leaders. They're pressuring Pilate, saying things like, this man has said he's a king. And if you are a follower of the uh, emperor Caesar... You will kill this man. We can't kill him, right? It's, not a, it's against our Jewish law to kill someone like that, but you can. Pilate, you can take him out for us. So Pilate, he's under all this pressure, and he thinks, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll have him flogged. I'll have him beaten to within an inch of his life just so that might satisfy them. So he brings them back, this beaten and, and disgraced Lord, right? They got the robe on him. They got the crown of thorns on him. He's all bloody and beaten up. Can you see this picture? Can you imagine what's going on in, in their mind? And they have Jesus standing right there. And here's Pilate. He comes back out and he's like, see, how about now? How about I release him to you and, and we trade for Barabbas or something like that, right? No, 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 no. That's not good enough. The religious people, they stir up the crowd and they're like, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It's not good enough. So Pilate, Pilate releases or relents. He gives in. And John, who was there, and he's, he's seen all of this, he says at that point, the soldiers took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went to the place of the skull to be crucified. 
Now, John doesn't write any, any details. There's no need for details at this point in his story because anyone in that time and that day and age, they, exa- they know exactly what happens at a crucifixion. They've seen it over and over and over. They knew exactly what it looked like. And then John records the words of Jesus from the cross. He's nailed to the cross. He's up there. He's bloody and he's beating and he's hurting. And what is his words from the cross? Nothing but love and grace and mercy. And he says to John, John, who's standing right next to Mary, the mother of Jesus, he says, John, take care of my mom. Mom, I love you. And John is going to take care of you. His last words up there are about taking care of family. And John was there, and he heard these words, the exact last words that Jesus uttered. It is finished. And then he dies. And John does this very unusual thing. He kind of pauses, and he reflects, and then he makes this statement. I don't think it's not for his immediate audience, John is looking to the future and future generations, and he's talking to us. And, and, and for, for you, he, he writes this, the man who saw this has given his testimony, and his testimony is true. What does that mean? Well, John's saying, you know what? I saw all of this, and I'm telling you the truth. This is exactly what I saw. I was there, and it, oh, man, I paid a price for what I'm telling you about Jesus. It cost me everything. I lost everything, but I saw Jesus die. And then I also saw what happened after, and John writes this. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. While Pilate, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a high-ranking religious official who had come to Jesus in the night before, the man who had earlier had visited Jesus that night, but Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. Now, why in the world would he bring 75 pounds of embalming stuff? Because these guys expected a dead man to do what a dead man does, and that stayed dead. Nobody was expecting a resurrection. Nobody was. John tells us that at the place where Jesus was to be crucified, there was a garden. And in that garden, a new tomb. And because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And this is just John's way of saying they were in a hurry. They went and got permission. They went and they embalmed Jesus, and they hurriedly, they get him to this tomb and close it up. Why? Because at sunset, it's going to be the Sabbath. And, and I've talked about this for the last several weeks, how many times did Jesus get in trouble for doing stuff and working on the Sabbath? So they don't want any more of that. So they're in a rush to get him in there. So they cover Jesus with all these spices, and they wrap him up, and they lay him in the tomb, and then they roll the big stone up in front of the hole to the, or the entrance to the cave, and then they disappear into the city. Why do they have to disappear? Because they are afraid for their lives. Look what they just did to Jesus, their leader, and we've been following him for years. They're going to come after us. But we don't know what John did that night. We don't know what John and Peter talked about that night. But you know, at least I think, they had to be thinking, man, the last three years of our life, what a waste. We devoted our entire lives. We dropped our nets and we followed him because he said, follow me. And Now we're convinced he's not who he said he was. He's not who he claimed to be, and they were in shock. We don't know what they did on Friday night. We really don't know what they did on Saturday, but John tells us that early Sunday morning, they were awakened, assuming they slept at all, they were awakened to a on the door. Someone's pounding on the door and instantly they're like, oh my gosh, the soldiers, they found us. They've come for us. And they're kind of freaking out. But then somebody's like, whoa, calm down. (laughs) If it was the soldiers, they would just kick the door in and come and get us, right? So they go and they check the door. They realize it's not the Romans. And who's there? (laughs) Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is there. And she was one of Jesus's most devoted followers, but she had been to the tomb. 
And she's freaked out. She's crying. She's bawling. They can barely understand her. And they're like, calm down, calm down. Tell us what's going on. Tell us what's going on. And then she finally, she says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. She doesn't assume that some miracles happened. She assumes what everybody assumed, that Jesus is dead, not a resurrection. She assumes that somebody came and stole the body. So here's, here's John and Peter. They've been hiding out for two days. So what do they do? Man, we're going to seize the moment. We're going down to the tomb. we got to see what's up. So they take off, and they're running. And this is what John says. He says, Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. By the way, the other disciple in there, that's John. And I kind of wonder, or you got to wonder, what is he thinking? Why does he put that part in there? You know, I, I got there first. I outrun Peter. One last jab at Peter or something. I don't know. Maybe Peter's not around. This one a little embarrassing for him. So anyway, he outruns Peter to the tomb. And then I think if John's, as he's, as he's dictating or writing this, he's like, well, if I tell him that part, I got to tell him the truth. <laughs> you see what happens? He, he, he runs to the tomb and he says this. He bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter comes flying by him, you know, and came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. John's like, I ran, outran Peter. I got to the tomb first, but I didn't go in <laughs> because I was afraid. It's dark in there, and it's a tomb. I don't know what to expect in there. Jesus has been dead for a few days now. You know, what, what's, what's up? I, I'm not proud of it, but I was too scared to go in. That's what John's telling us. And, and he's not making himself out to be a hero. He just wants us all to know that he's just as confused just like about Jesus and all the other disciples are on that Easter morning. They don't know what's going on. They didn't expect a resurrection. They expected Jesus to stay dead in the tomb, and they are freaking out. But Peter runs straight past him right into the tomb because that's Peter. That's who he is. He's, you know, he has no filter. He's, he's, he's the man that you want behind you in a fight or in front of you, man. He's all about it. He's going to get to the point. He has nothing is going to stop him. And John says this, we saw the strangest thing in our world changed. We saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus, Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Now, I'm no Sherlock Holmes or anything, but if I'm going to steal a body, I'm not going to take the time to undo all that stuff, fold it up nice and neat, and stack it up, right? So John finally musters up the courage to step inside, and he writes about you know, himself and what he saw. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and he believed. He saw and he believed. His world had just been turned upside down. His whole world has changed because the resurrection of Jesus has reframed his entire life. I mean, think about it. If it starts to click, right? It starts to click and you start to remember and realize that, oh my gosh, everything Jesus taught was true. Every word that he told me was absolutely true. Everything Jesus did or said about God the Father was true. He realized that when Jesus told him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I'm as close to an understanding what God is like that you will ever get. That's what Jesus told his disciples. If you want to see God, look at me. And John's starting to get this. John's like, oh my gosh, it is all true. We don't know where Jesus is, but clearly he has risen from the dead. I saw him crucified. I saw him die. I saw him embalmed. I saw him buried. And now he is risen. He is risen. <laughs> I love this part too. John and Peter, they, after this, right, they're still freaked out a little bit. And they run back. They got to go tell everybody else. They run back to the disciples and they get to the room, you know, in this locked room and they're in there and he's, they're starting to tell the story and suddenly there's Jesus right there in the middle of the room. Remember, this room is a locked room. They got in there and they're hiding out. They're scared, right? They're hiding out and here's Jesus and he's, they're like, it's him. He's alive. And Jesus says this. He says, peace be with you. Why did he say that? Because he just scared the bejesus out of him, right? I mean, just imagine, poof, there's Jesus. Oh, my gosh, right? Right in the middle of the room. Would that not freak us out? Yeah, he scared them. So they settled down a little bit. They find, okay, it's Jesus. Whew, okay, man, don't do that, Jesus. Scare me, man. They settle down. They talk. They eat. And they believe. 
And everybody's there except for who? Thomas. Doubting Thomas, right? You guys remember that story? We don't know where Thomas was, but he does arrive later, and the disciples are going crazy. Like, man, you got to understand what we happened. And, and they, they get him in the room, and they're like, hey, Thomas, we got to talk to you, man. We've seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hands into the wound in his side. Thomas is like, John, buddy, <laughs> I love you, man, but your words are not enough for me. Peter, I love you too, but you are kind of crazy, and I think you're seeing things, right? And the rest of you guys, I love you too, but man, I just spent three years of my life following a false messiah. I'm not doing it. I'm not spending another day, and I'm not going to spend the rest of my life chasing a ghost. Not going to happen. No way, no how. I mean, who could blame him? Who could blame him, right? Three years of his life, and the guy dies on us? The guy who said he was the savior of the world? But then it happens, and John writes this. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, here he goes again, Jesus scaring everybody, right? Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God, he believes. He believes because Jesus is right there with him. And I love this part. The, the, the Greek translation of this verse literally says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. He tells Thomas, do not be unbelieving, but believing. This is John's th central theme. And then, are you ready for this? At this moment, Jesus leaves the immediate context as he he's looks through the ages. And he looks and he peers at you. And he's looking at me. And all of you online, he's looking at you. And he says to his disciples, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. He's telling them, guys, you guys have seen me. You've been around me, and that's great. And you believe, that's wonderful. Oh, my gosh, but just think about all the people who are going to believe because of you. Just think about who all the people who are going to be blessed because of you, John, and the people you tell and the people that read your account that you write and your account, Matthew, and your account, Peter. Blessed are the future generations that hear and believe but have not seen. He's talking to us. All of us. We are blessed because we believe without seeing. And then John closes his account with this. He closes with an invitation for all of us and Imitations is simple. It's what he said throughout his entire gospel. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. We can have life in his name just by believing. So this Easter, 2021, after one of the craziest, most difficult years ever, maybe this Easter is where you can answer for yourself, who is Jesus to me? Can you say that with me? Who is Jesus to me? John would say, I hope that my account leads you to a place where you can believe. I hope that what I wrote will lead you or, or get you to where you're in a place where you can believe Jesus is who he said he is. He said he is God in human form. He is the love of God who walked this earth, the mind of God teaching us. And that in believing, you have life. In believing, you have purpose. In believing, you can experience forgiveness. In believing, we can live a life of joy and live sacrificially where we can live beyond ourselves and think about others first because it, that's the life that's really life. That's the life that we've all been chasing. What would it look like? What would it look like for you to lean into that truth deeper than you ever have today?
Easter is a great day to say, or to maybe, maybe say again, Jesus, I choose you. Jesus, I believe. I believe the resurrection is real. Jesus, I believe that you are alive, and that changes everything. And for today, that is the good news. May you all continue to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come to you this Easter morning with a smile on our face. Thank you for the words of John and all the Gospels in the New Testament, Lord, that, that we believe because of what they have told us. We believe because of what they saw. God, we believe most of all because, because of you and your sacrifice. I don't know where everybody's at in, this, in their walk with Jesus today. Maybe they're not they don't know you at all today, God, but I pray that in this moment right now that you would become that Lord and Savior to them. Help us to experience you in a new way today. God, fill us with your spirit and help us to be the light in this world so that others may believe based on what we experience and what we tell other people. God, use us. Bless us. We ask and we pray all of this in your beautiful son's most holy name. Amen.